Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have tonight. Thank you for bringing us through another week, bringing us together. And we, Father, we ask you to continue to guide and direct us and keep our spirits calm and our minds uh, sharp on looking to you and trusting you and making you for giving us strength to get through the daily struggles and challenges and things that are distracting away from the joy and the peace that's with you. So we ask you to continue to guide us, direct us, fill us with your knowledge of your spirit and your warmth and your love and your guidance as your word corrects us, edifies us, instructs us, disciplines us, encourages us to live the way that you know you desire of us. So we thank you that you've already ordained all these things that happen. We want to walk in the fruits of things that make you pleasing and benefits that have benefits and blessings to you and then you give back to us. And so Father, we thank you for this time we have. We ask you to be our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, uh, our counselor in all these things of understanding into the scriptures that look continuously into your appearances that you made before your physical appearance the ultimate manifestation of you as Yeshua, the Messiah, Mashiach, the Savior of all mankind that you have ordained before time. Those men before, out of all the creation you have ordained, we just thank you that we are one of those people out of all those different types of mankind that you have preordained that we were one of those people. We just thank you and we just ask you to continue to be with us, guide us and direct us. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Okay, so uh, who's, who's online now? Well, hello, everybody. So uh, for those of us who are seeing me on a video or some other fashion, uh, you can s go to the website, www.pfbcstudies.com. That's P as in precious, F as in faith, B as in Bible, C as in church, studies.com. And you can see other PDFs of charts, uh, Word docs and of videos to recall anything that if I say something that is a, aloof to you or different, you can go back and view and get more information on that pertaining to whatever the topic is that you can find on those three avenues of video, PDF, or of a chart. With that being in mind, we're on our continuous study, part five of Theophanies and Christophanies. Um, this is a continuation of looking at this from a fresh and anew. Tonight's uh, agenda will be to get through the uh, all of the litany of things that we've looked at so far, reviewing those, and then looking to view has, how can a man see God uh, when it says that no man's supposed to be able to do that and live? And then look at the, uh, again, the looking forward to the angelic host and how they were shown to appear as men and, and then leave us with closing out on the reflections of what we've seen, the aspects of how to justify or examine that question of how can a man see God and then leave us for a setup for Sunday where we will continue and really pierce into the mentionings of the phrasing, the angel of the Lord. That'll be the entire focus on Sunday to look at those scriptures and passages to really delve into that. So first things first in review to reflect and keep us in mind where we're at. We have thus far seen God appearing as, again, a theophany, more of a spiritual manifestation, a Christophany, 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 if I can say that. A physical manifestation. Again, Theo means God. Uh, the phineo means appearance or the appearances of God, spiritual manifestation. God the Father, that is. And then over here we have Christophany. So it's God the Son. I forgot to put God the Father. And I'll put God the Son right here. Oh. Okay. All right, so the appearances of God the Father and God the Son. I did it over here, too, but I want to make sure we manifest here. So we saw so far that God appeared in a dream to Abram, Abimelech, Jacob, Samuel, and Solomon, spanning a, about a thousand-year period of time that God did that. Again, we bring to the, to the forefront of people's minds that want to say that um, uh, dreams and visions are of and for today and of the Scripture to never change. And yet I always would submit to you that there's only been a 1,000 year period uh, from which God did this type of communication. I find that rather interesting given that everybody wants us to believe that it was a, you know, rule of thumb for God. So before the time of Christ, you had 4,000 years on the earth of which only 1,000, so one fourth of those years where God uh, over that span of time communicated in dreams. I find that to be uh, enlightening and, and, and problematic for those who want to say signs and wonders 
are throughout the whole Bible, and God's never stopped changing the way he does it, and yet we only find a 1,000-year period from which he, he did the dreams. So, interesting. Then we find he appeared in a vision uh, to Abraham, Abimelech, Nathan, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Again, we have about a period of about, again, from 2000 B.C. Goes a little further this time to Ezekiel and Isaiah. We go all the way out to about, oh, goodness gracious, I'm going to say around, around 600 B.C., roughly. So, yeah, granted, there's more years being being put into here, but the reality is that it's still just over a thousand. But again, when you consider the whole 4,000 years before Christ had come, you're talking, I'll give you a, a, an added couple hundred years. So we'll round it off and say 1,400 at the max. So you got 1,400 years in there uh, that, that God was dealing with dreams and visions out of the 4,000 years. Only 1,400 of those were in that find uh, that we see. Then we also saw that, don't forget also that we saw that God, we saw that sometimes God can appear, for example, put on the side here, that we saw that God can appear in a vision within a dream. Which speaks to truth within truth. In other words, i.e. spiritual mysteries in the Bible. He did this with Jacob and with Samuel. The scripture says he spoke to them in a dream, but it also says it was a vision in the dream that we saw. So we do know that God can do this, and we do know that this is something that, again, speaks to, well, why would he do that? We talked about that, and because God could talk in a vision directly without using a dream, which is when you're awake. Then God can say, well, I can do it over here, too, when, when I'm just in a situation of, again, being in that state of, I'm just going to do it as a vision when you're awake or a dream when you're asleep. So why take you from a dream and talk to you and then also put a vision within that dream. What, what, why do that? And so there's a different aspect of, I mentioned, it's more of a 3D aspect of you're awake. So in a dream, your body's sleeping, but your soul spirit is awakened to this reality of a 3D, I mentioned like a, a 3D uh, IMAX, a full landscape of interactivity of real life. And so it's really interesting to, to see that. So we all God talked about that. And then we saw God appearing as a man. We saw that, and we saw God appear as a... Is there a question, babe? Sorry. I thought I saw you. Sorry. Uh, God appeared as a man. We, th we, we don't know this for certain, but it was inferred that he appeared as a man as he walked through Eden to ha Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, to Enoch, to Noah, and the people at Babel. So we don't know for certain because it's not directly stated, but we saw the scriptures that lead us to believe there's enough conjecture there that you could say, you know, interesting. Because remember... He walked in the garden. Enoch and, and Noah had the word with, as in close in proximity, walked with God. Then we saw the Tower of Babel people, that, that God came, he descended down to look. And so why would he use the word descend to look when he has the greatest view ever, an eagle's eye view with no problem with eyesight zoning in? The fact that it says he descended would, to me, mean more than just a spiritual descent. We can't prove that concretely, but it does allude to the fact that maybe he traversed through the folks just to uh, let them know later on in historical reference that is a precursor to how sometimes we entertain angels unawares. I was going to look at that also, that scripture, right? They didn't really realize it was him possibly, much like they did when he rose again from the dead. He was incognito. They didn't know who he was. So could that be what happened? I don't know, and we don't know that. Didn't say it. Doesn't say it did or did not happen. And so we have some, that's why I have them in parents. So ha Adam and Eve, ha Adam and Eve, Enoch, Noah, and people of Babel is in parents, because I don't know for certain. There's no direct uh, confirmation of that. But there is confirmation. He appeared to Abram twice, Genesis 12, Genesis 17, where he then changed his name to Abraham and appeared to him, of course, in the infamous uh, Mamre, uh, where he was talking to him about the, how many people you spare in Sodom and Gomorrah. Then he appears to Isaac and Jacob and Moses, and then a long time later to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Big gap. 
they got a big gap there of around, sheesh, almost uh, 900 years, roughly, before he appears to those guys. Rather interesting. A big gap. So you have some uniqueness of these men that I believe that speaks to that why would he appear to them? And it really rings, raises the question, it, they're more than what we think they are. And that's why I say that they are a type of the soon metakoi during the tribulation period who are protected by God's seal and they will not be harmed. They are the ones pictured in Revelation 14 standing on Mount Zion. So as we saw thus far, the, the point I'm, we're making here is in seeing what God does, look at the, I want to see the overlap. I want you to see this. The overlap is, what's the overriding character trait of the one, look at that. Who's the person that appears in all three lists? Abram. Abram's the only common denominator in all three lists. God appeared to Abram as in a dream, in a vision, and as a man. Just think about that. So then when you go back to over, when you read, when you go to the book of James, for example, let's go to the book of James. Verse, uh, chapter 2. I'll put this on the board here. So in James 2, 23, it says, And the scripture was verified, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Now that is profound. Because when you see this in the past, you've seen it, I've seen it, and many times, I mean, I can tell you that I've had my own thoughts about why that was. Uh, about, I mean, my first thought was that obviously he was the father of the Hebraic people. Number one. Number two, he was known as Father Abraham because God showed in him the fatherly love that he has for us, of a natural born child, of an adopted child of a, a child of a different mother, but his same seed. He loved all of them in a, in a very tight similitude fashion. And so I thought of him as the sense of, number one, the father of Hebrew people, the fact that he was, number two, a father of different diverse sons, and he loved them all with an endearment of no indifference. So I saw him as a person that was a good word picture of how God wanted to show his love, and then he showed his love living unto him and then also through him. And so I thought, well, maybe that's why he's called a friend of God. And, of course, we have the infamous... <clears throat> excuse me, word picture of the father and the son, him and Isaac, on Mount Moriah, from which later on Jerusalem would be built. And so he was that forerunner of the foreshadow of the father, sacrificing his only begotten son. So those things maybe always think about, you know, Abraham, Abram, and then in there was that mix of circumcision, which, you know, defi which defines the Jewish people's physical covenant. So you kind of see all that similitude. Okay, that's why he was a friend. But now, studying this, it makes me think, okay, all that may be true, but I think what's really interesting, earmark, is that this seems to be an interesting symmetry that Abram's the only person God appeared to in a dream, in a vision, and as a man. No one else can say, I got all three. I got my boxes checked. My bucket list, he's got it all checked off. To see God in a dream, check. And a vision, got that too. How about as a man? Yep, got that one too. Say what? Oh, yeah. And not to mention, don't forget that I contend that, that uh, Moses at More was taught Hebrew, which is why in Genesis 12, later on, when he is going to rescue Lot, they say there's Abraham, Abram the Hebrew, because that does not exist before that time, which means that the language itself, the culture, his walk, his talk, his whole demeanor had been changed. So he was actually, because More means teacher, and then he was at More when the guy was leaving from the Ur of the Chaldees. And I contend that's where the, my conjecture comes in that God instituted Hebrew right then and there and made him a different, different creation, if you will. Uh, he first brought him and renovated him at that point. That was his first renovation. So when you have this renovation, it's interesting that, that he has a lot of iconic things that happen in his life that are unique to him and him alone. And not to mention these things we see. And so is any shock we see in James 2.23, he's called a friend of God. So who does Abraham speak to? Because, of course, notice how it says Abraham. Because Abram, within Abraham, was Abram, right? Abram's within Abraham. 
and his name itself is a reference to the sporo sporos and the sperma, but in opposite format, because in the sporos, the word of God is the sperma, the kingdom, the word of the kingdom, right? Or the secret of the kingdom of the God, and within that is also the word of the kingdom. So you have the sporos, which is the word of God. Within is the secret of the kingdom of the God. Then within that is the word of the kingdom. Well, if you think about this and what you see here with Abram, with, within, within, with Abram is the opposite. Abram was, the, was not the outside going in. He was the inside going out. So you have the sporos and Abram. The sperma with the Abraham, which is where the breath of God was breathed into him and his life was changed. The depth of his walk changed dramatically. A covenant was introduced with blood, with physical circumcision of the flesh. And then you have Isaac coming out of him where the promised seed would then be uh, dictated as the stars of the heavens promise would be given to him. Uh, reinstituted earlier, stated in Genesis 15, but restated later on to him after Isaac. So, of course, you had the most famous of all for sacrifice we mentioned before of his only begotten son. So we're bringing that up because I just want to, sh want to see the differences there and why God appeared and who he appeared to. So it's interesting to look at these, these people. And the one person that stands out of the dreams doesn't seem to make sense to me is Abimelech. Interesting, isn't it? Of all the people in the Old Testament to appear into a dream is an obscure person in Abimelech. Doesn't seem to make sense, right? I think the obscure one to me on the vision is Balaam. Another obscure, like, really? I can get why you appear to the rest of these guys in a dream, you know? Abram, Jacob, Samuel, Solomon, I get it. On a vision, Abram, Nathan, Isaiah, Ezekiel, I get it. Good dudes. Balaam, not so much. Abimelech, not so much. They're not horrible people, but they weren't great men of God. So it's interesting, in both occasions, dream and a vision, he has one person each time he appears to that wasn't up to snuff, if you will, with the rest of them. We could all agree on that, right? Then, as you see, as he appears as a man, interesting enough, not that I'm saying Shabbat and Meshach and Abednego aren't up to snuff, but when you, can, when you contrast those guys to the other guys, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, they're not the same level. of That's not the same playing field. It's more like Hall of Fame guys and all pro, right? These guys, are, these guys are Hall of Fame for the Jewish people. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, remember? And Moses, the greatest prophet before Jesus. As a sinner, there's nobody better prophet than Moses. And so those four guys, you see this pattern God has when he appears as a dream and vision and as a man. He has the majority of people at a greater level, and he has that different level of person that he still chooses to bless. So what does that represent? It represents, for me, the duality of what we call the bicameral kingdom or the kingdom of, the, of earth and the kingdom of the heavens, that there's two realms of blessing of different airships. But you can clearly see that they both are blessed. They both are benefited on heaven and earth. Just like you can clearly see all these are blessed and benefited, all these are and all these are. But you're going to sit here and tell me that Abimelech's the same as the other guys? No. Balaam, same as those guys? No. Shabbat, Mesek, and Abednego, the same level of, of godly men as those four men? No. But still blessed and still benefited, are they not? So you have an imagery there, I think a, a symbolism, a typology of how you see the airship of the heavens and the airship of the earth. Both benefits, both blessings, both wonderful things that God bestows upon you. But do not be mistaken, there's a demarcation between the two. You can't, even though they're in the same sentence, if you will, of who God appeared to in the dream, let's get real, when you look at the body of work of how God worked in these men's life, He does not hold a candle to those other men. Neither does He to the other men. Neither do they to the other men. <laughs> they just don't. They don't, right? So with that being said, this is our review so far that we've been at. And I want to take a, a moment also to go back and look. I didn't mention this. Also, I, was, I thought I was going to do this, but I want to also look, as we mentioned, God saying to, okay, so in Ezekiel, whoop, he said, God says he, he, he carries, whoop, ah, I'm just going to put carry, singular. Carry away in spirit. That's a different thing. So carried away in spirit is a reference to, to literal 
like time travel. Like you're going forward or backward in time. So we see this with Ezekiel. And this is in Ezekiel 37. And also Revelation. When John says it in 17. 3 and 21. 10. Okay, so let's go. Before I get into the next question, I want to get to the question. Saying what I just said and reviewing what we just reviewed, we're going to look into, but I thought man can't see God. So let's look at this other fashion first. I want to make sure we, have, we address these two things as well as we look at that. So if you go to uh, Ezekiel 37, <clears throat> Ezekiel 37. So if you look at the very first verse of Ezekiel 37, he says, then the, then the hand of the Lord came upon me, and the Lord led me out in spirit and set me in the midst of a plain which was full of human bones. And so Ezekiel and John share this, this similitude of this reference, that they were led out or carried away or carried in spirit. And it mentions it's basically a time-traveling phrasing. Because what it means is you're out of the physics of the normalcies of time and space. You are not bound by time and space and physical laws. You are taken away in spirit. So you are defying time, space, relativity, physics, physical laws. None of that applies when you're talking about that phrase. None of that applies. Not, not none of it. You're out of that realm because now you're in God's hand of, in essence, like a time travel. It's insane. So to imagine, again, a dream is a vision, I mean, is a, is a excuse me, is a, you're seeing a, a, a visage, if you will, an appearance of, of things. When you get a, of things and of God himself, when you see a vision of things and of God himself, it's more of an interactive 3D. Then you get to a character and spirit, it's real life. So the vision is as close to a character and spirit as you can get. But character and spirit is real life, but just in a different time. It's, it's really wow. So... That's over there. So also look at Ezekiel, I mean, excuse me, Ezekiel. Revelation chapter 17, you'll see this. Chapter 17 um, and verse 3. And it says, And he conducted me in spirit into the desert, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, right? So John writes that in Revelation 17, 3. Then in Revelation 21, 10, John writes that he also says, in 21.10, he bore me away in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out from heaven, from God, out of heaven from God. So we do see that there's this reference to being carried away in spirit. So I want to make sure we reference that for those who might say, hey, wait a minute, I thought you said God does dreams and visions. And how about those Ezekiel and John aspects of carried away in spirit? Where does that fit in? Well, that's not the dream. That's not a vision. That's not him appearing as a man. That's them being carried away out of time, space, and physical realm of boundaries and being carried forward in time. And then Jeremiah, he was actually taken back in time. doesn't use that exact phrase, carried away in spirit. But you kind of see that phrasing uh, referred to a whole different dynamic, uh, different from a dream or a vision or God appearing as a man. But I want to make sure we made mention of it because they definitely saw in both cases uh, God in his, in his glory and not in a physical fashion right in front of them, but in John's case, yes, because got, got, John describes him, but in Ezekiel's case, he doesn't have that description per se, but he does in a vision talk about in the throne room. So they did, I could dare say, they may not mention it as, as, as uh, demonstrably or as directly that God was a man appearing to them, but you do see it in John's case easily in Revelation. He had the eyes of fire and the hair of wool and feet of brass and the apron pulled up and so forth, and he hears the voice of many thunders. And so John definitely makes that crystal clear to you. In Ezekiel's case, he doesn't mention God appearing like that to him, but he mentions what he saw in, in the throne room. So you, you do have that interesting aspect. So it comes to that question now in our study where we say, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. You said dream, vision as a man, then carried away in spirit. But wait a minute, a, God, a man can't see God. Man's supposed to drop dead when they see God. God's in His glory. God's in His holiness. Man can't see Him. Bible says that, doesn't it? 
Let's go read it. So let's go read. Let's read in, in, in Exodus chapter 33. So turn with me, Exodus 33. Exodus 33. And we're looking at verses 17 through 20. And the Lord, Calve, said unto Moshe, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my eyes, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy. Sound familiar? That's Romans 9. And he said, thou cannot, thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Wow. Now I read the rest of the chapter there. And the Lord Chave said, Behold, this is the place by me, that thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass that while my glory pass by, I will, not, that, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand, and will I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou wilt see my back parts, but by my face shall not be seen. So, I should rephrase this to include all verses. Should have just included them all. So, is there questions online, babe? A comment? Okay. So, cannot see the face of God and live. And Moses saw his backside, saw a part of his backside. So, did Moses actually see God in the face? No. Well, well, wait a minute. Because, you know, the scripture, it says that God spoke to Moses face to face as one would talk to a friend. But it says here, you can't see God face to face or else you're going to drop dead. Yes. Now, remember, Adam and Eve... Two things there. Number one, there's no direct evidence that he was manifested to them as a man. We have the precursor to that in Genesis 3, 8, as he walked in the garden, walking, present tense, and therefore we know that that could have been an obvious notion that that's what always happened. That's what it's, it's worded as. But we can't prove that that's what it means because some people say it's more of a, a figurative sense because it says they heard him walking. It doesn't say they saw him walking. It doesn't say that. It says they heard his voice walking in the garden. Yes? Pam said, I have a note in my Bible that uh, the Hebrew word for back means hereafter of time. Huh. Okay. Hereafter of time, you said? Yes. Huh. Oh, I did not even look that up, so I don't know. But that, that's interesting. I, I will definitely look that up now. But I can tell you that. It's Strong's number 268. Thanks for sharing that. So, I'll tell you what we'll do here. We'll just say, I'll put it this way. It's all part of God's glory. How about that? So when you see this, this, this part of Scripture that, that says that this is not what happened, where he did not see God face to face because God said, if you do, you're going to die. Well, then how come God said that he talks to Moses face to face as if one talks to a friend, remember? So well, uh, how, how does that work out? Because remember... 
Look in verse 11 of the same chapter. Same chapter 33 of Exodus. Look in verse 11. And the Lord Chave spoke unto Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend. What? But you just got finished saying in verse 19, the name of the Lord before thee, before thy face, it says that, right? Then it says in verse 20, thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man human see me and live. Say, say what? Well, then how come you said earlier you spoke to him face to face, right? So there's a difference. So when God says he spoke to him face to face versus seeing him face to face, the key is proximity. The key is proximity. Yes? I think you said something changed between these two events. There's a big, well, what happened here is that God is pointing out how when God talked to Moses before, and we have gotten this, when he, we haven't gotten to this yet, but we're going to, there's a little prelude to Sunday's lesson about the angel of the Lord. God uses that appearance as a vestige of veiling between he and man. But he constituted as, as himself and as into the burning bush, it speaks of the angel of the Lord is how God appeared in that bush and spoke unto Moses. And so God can have this, this, this visage, this, this veil between he and us so that he can constitute it as being face to face talking with us, but yet not in his fullness of who he is because if we did that, we would die. So God's not lying when he says, I spoke to Moses face to face, because he did in many different forms and functions and fashions and a, and a fire and a cloud and, and, you know, and from the different aspects of this case and the thunderings and lightnings and he would come to thick darkness, remember? And so God did speak to Moses face to face, but not without a veil, not without a, a, some kind of a, a visage between the two, which speaks to the curtains that separated the most holy place from the holy of holies, which speaks to the physical flesh on God the Son that veiled us from dropping dead Fred. So yeah, they did in fact see each other face to face, God and Moses, but not in the fullness of God. Not in God's fullness of his face. Not that. God just means, I spoke to Moses face to face. True, but there was a buffer between us. There was a manifestation of fire or cloud or thick darkness or a burning bush. There was always something between us, or I would appear to him as an angel of the Lord. I did not appear to him in my fullness of my glory and then talk to him face to face. That's insane. He would be dead, is what God is saying. So that's the difference. So I hope you will understand that and finally put to bed on that issue there, why the controversy, why the conflict. There is no conflict. There's no controversy. It's a misunderstanding and application of what God is intending to mean and what he is saying from the previous examples he's already given. We looked at some of them already as a dream, as a vision, and as a man, there was a, a, a curtain in between. But yet, now we, we have to get to the angel of the Lord aspects to see more of that, which we'll do on Sunday. You'll see more of how he uses that phrasing and that appearance as a veil between he and man. So that's the first passage. Then you go to, uh, to Numbers chapter 12. Let's go to Numbers in chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Numbers 12, verses 6 to 8. And he said, Hear now, by beseech my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, I, Chave, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. We already saw that before, that there's two different things, dream and vision. We pointed this verse out before to separate the two. But keep reading, all the way to verse 8. My servant Moses, Moshe, is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Well, I saw this before, but I want to point out again. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently in a vision, and not in dark speeches or riddles. And the similitude of Chave, shall he behold, wherefore then we are not afraid to speak against the servant, to speak against my servant Moses. So he said, I'll speak to him mouth to mouth. So again, he's just talking about what he's, talk, what he's emphasizing here. The emphasis here from God is whom 
he speaks to as, what's the word I'm looking for, as um, his ambassador. His spokesman. Is not the same as speaking to others. So God's telling you, right? What God's showing you is a pattern that God speaks differently to his ambassador and spokesman that he has called. So those who want to say things like, for example, well, what's the application of that? Well, it's pretty clear to me that who God calls to lead is who God calls to lead. We talked about this last week. You don't have pulpit committees. That, that's insanity and that's ignorant. That's all based on man-made malarkey. Well, we're searching for our pastor in the pulpit committee. Oh, that's in the Bible, right? Because there's always in the Old Testament people just, you know, the, the lower shelf folks were choosing out their leader. That's always sanctioned by God, right? No. No. God appointed his people. And then under them, they were then put in charge to have others underneath them. As Moses did the elders, the apostles did the deacons. What a coincidence. I don't care if you're an Old Testament guy or gal or New Testament guy or gal. It didn't matter. There was an order of things. God appointed his peeps, and they had other people underneath them, not vice versa. The bottom didn't grow up to a place and go, hmm, interesting. We need some people here. And um, Johnny looks good. Susie so Oh, we're going we're gonna to vote. Let's vote. And, uh, okay, Johnny won. <laughs> what? No, no, they went by uh, 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 all the votes, need a majority rule. Really? Where, where's that at? Well, there is a vote, by the way, and I remember a couple of votes in the Bible. They casted lots, uh, uh, Esther and Haman, they casted lots for Jonah on the boat. They casted lots for Matthias and the, the apostle. I don't remember any of those things being in a good sense. Do you? Because when they did it for Jonah, it was not cool. When they did it for Esther, it was about to kill her. One could debate the apostle a bit cost and lost, but they were trying to do it just to replace the guy without being led by God to do so because they were just waiting and chilled out. They just seen that God had Paul just say, hello, he's right over there, he's hanging out. Just four years later, well, excuse me, that's not true. Eleven years later, there's Paul. Eleven years later, poof, Paul's on the scene, and Paul's now the last vestige. He's added on to the 12 apostles. But in their defense, let's get, I mean, it's kind of difficult. I mean, it's hard to be patient and wait on God. I get it. But the reality is that we get this whole casting of lots or voting and all this jazz from our human government desire to infuse our human government stuff into church, into our, into our Christian belief system, which we, I call churchianity. When you take human government and you infuse it into Christianity, you get churchianity. Because it's all about form and function then. It's all about form and function, it's all about tradition, it's all about majority, it's all about all that other stuff. And you lose sight of the Lord, His Word, and therefore truth becomes relative, truth becomes not the major issue anymore, it becomes a part of the many things that you're concerned about, and it just, it's, not, it's not good. It's just not good. Not good at all. So the reality is, my point being, that going back to Numbers 12, God speaks differently to His spokesman, to His ambassador, to his leader, if you will, than he does to the other people he spoke to. God make that God made and makes that clear. I mean, if you don't see that, then that's just because you're refusing to see that. But it's pretty obviously clear when God puts down the phrasing of dreams and visions in Numbers 12, 6, and goes on to go talk about Moses and him and say, uh, yeah, we talk mouth to mouth, to mouth as, in, as in like, you know, boom, boom. As in there's more of a direct connection, there's more intimacy there than there's with the other guys. He doesn't not care about him. He does care about the other people he's talked to, you know, but not the same way here as, as he and Moses. So then we go to John 1. They go to New Testament now. Let's go there. New Testament phrases talk about cannot see God. Let's go to John 1, 18. Let's go to John chapter 1 and verse 18. No one has ever seen God the only begotten Son, who is the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. 
Uh, by the way, as we look back there, excuse me, going back. So being in the bosom of the Father, he has made, he has made known. Okay? So this is talking about when he says, no one has seen. So Jesus... Yeshua is the manifestation of God's glory and veiled. I spell is veiled V I E V veiled V E I. I can't remember how you spell it. Veiled in human flesh. Which is why it says earlier in verse uh, 14, And the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of an only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Does it not say that in John 1, 14? Well, it just said we beheld his glory, but, 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 but we can't see that because we'd be dropped dead Fred. So it had to say before that, the word became flesh, which contained his glory, but because of the flesh was the veil, we could then see the glory of God through the flesh, which is manifested in Christ, which is why no man has seen God, but Christ has made him manifest. He's the physical visage of God. All right. Oh, and, and see Hebrews, we saw it before. Flavor to that, you can actually go and, and see Hebrews, we saw it before where he's the exact impress of God. Okay? So now we go to 1 Timothy. I hope, you have a, I hope you're good with that. Again, we're John 1.18 is Jesus, Yeshua, is the manifestation of God's glory veiled in human flesh. So what does it mean by no one can see God? Again, in his glory. If it wasn't for the flesh of Jesus, you would die. If he, puts his, if he takes his flesh away, it's over, man. It's over. You're done. You're toast. You, you can't. <laughs> so when Jesus, which here's where the weird part comes in, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and his kind of glory went out, that was profound. They all didn't die, remember? They saw Moses and Elijah. Peter thought it was the Feast of Sukkot was starting to do a tent. That's what you do in Sukkot. You build, you make tents. And he was thinking Sukkot means God's manifesting himself amongst his people, which was the day in which Christ was born. How interesting. On his birthday, in essence, he was doing a Sukkot representation of his glory being made manifest. But was it fully in his glory? I say no. The transfiguration was very similar and likened unto what God the Father earlier did with Moshe and the cleft of the rock when he showed a part of himself to Moshe, because he showed all of himself, he would have died. The fact that they didn't die, that Peter, James, and John were alive, that they were alive before, during, and after, proves to you he did not show his full glory to them. And they already were amazed as it was what they did see. What they saw was a glimpse. What they saw was a piece of him shining forth of his glory. He pierced a bit of his inner, inner self, his flesh was peered away a little bit. It's almost like I, I imagine, not to get comic book on you, but I imagine like a like a Clark Kent scene. I imagine Jesus just peering back a little bit of the flesh, like, yeah, I'm I'm God. And then, he puts it back. I, I not that he not that he did that. I'm just trying to that Superman gesture of opening the shirt and singing the big S. It's like Jesus just kind of pierced some of his flesh was coming down from the veil, and the glory was shooting out, and they are like, oh, wow. Yeah. The full flesh didn't come down, my, my friend. Are you kidding me, Jack? If the whole flesh came down, they'd be dead. We'd all be dead. You, you can't do that in a sinful body, that is. There's no way. So that's what he's talking about in John 1.18. The flesh that is put on the Logos, the living word, is the veil of the Holy of Holies that prevents us from dying so we can see God face to face. We can see God manifest in Christ because of the flesh that veils that, that glory inside. All right? Now we have 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. We okay back there, babe? 
Yeah. Okay. Remember, remember this. Don't forget, we're about to get to that in a second. But I'll tell you ahead of time what you just mentioned. You got you to address that question you just asked. Here's the issue with that. How did Jesus ascend to the Father in flesh? Because the flesh that Jesus, Yeshua, God the Son, ascended with was no longer of, of first of all, his flesh did not have sinful blood in it, number one. Right? There was no sinful blood in Jesus. He's the unspotted, blameless Lamb of God. Right? We all know that. So his blood was the blood of God, the Father. That's the first thing that God created was this blood. It sat to the side, then it was infused into this baby impregnated inside this woman who never saw a man before in intimate fashion. And so now this blood's infused into this baby. He has the blood of God in him, and he comes with this blood being sinless to redeem us. Now, with that being said, that blood which he took to the mercy seat in the heavens was a blood that was sinless and spotless and pure, different from our flesh and our blood. Remember, flesh itself is not evil because angels had flesh, remember? In Jude 6 and 7, they left. We're going to look at that in a moment. I mean, I'll show you that they, right here, angels appears at, appeared as men because they went after strange flesh, left their first estate, it says. They went after heterox flesh, which is different from flesh. Jesus said he had flesh and bone when he rose again from the dead. He had flesh and bone. So flesh and blood can inherit, but flesh and bone, no problem. So again, we talked about how people say in the nursing area, Vicki and Laney, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Bones have marrow. Marrow has blood. What gives? Well, apparently, uh, flesh and bone animated by spirit don't need no blood and therefore don't need no marrow. Therefore, there ain't no marrow, ain't no bone with no blood. So when you're animated by spirit and you got flesh and bone, you ain't got no marrow because you ain't got no blood. So you don't need for that. So hard for me to imagine. It goes back to Laney's question from last week. Do we have a heart in our bodies in heaven or in any redeemed body? Do we have a heart in a solical body or spiritual body if, in fact, there's no blood pumping through our veins? And I would say, well, interesting fact is that whether we do or we don't is not really the question. The question is, can we have a heart or anything, there, therefore, that can be operating in a different fashion than what we know of it today? And the answer is yes. Yes, we can have things in our current state that in our minds operate in one way. But God can say, no, that same thing will exist again in a sinless state, but operate in a different way. But you don't yet understand that, and nor do I, but it doesn't mean it's not true. So that's where that comes in. So great question and comment about the flesh, but the issue is he's sinless, he's perfect, he's blameless, he's spotless. So flesh is different for, for Christ, for Yeshua. And so when he ascended to the Father, no problem with his flesh, no problem with his blood, whole different situation, to totally. Uh, to, that's, that's how he could go up there. That's not a problem. Yes? And he said, that's what makes God, God. Yeah. But, you know, remember, too, there's, I mentioned before from the issue that, and you asked the question about the heart. I mentioned about the teeth, for example, as an example. I mentioned how God put our teeth in our, in our mouth, and we had these canine teeth. They just didn't, you know, we've always had these teeth, right? I got these big vampire teeth in our, in our family. We always joke and say we always tell a Bel Air because they have these big, you know, canine teeth. And yet we all have these teeth that are like carnivorous, um, made to chew into complex amino acids and chew through meat. And so, yeah, we were made vegetarians at first not to eat animals, but now we eat animals. So what does that tell you? Well, God's not shocked by the fact that sin came in. It was all ordained. So he already gave us a preset resource from which to work through that process. So ergo... I would say Adam and Eve already had a heart without blood pumping through it. And then when they sinned, blood started to pump through it. And so therefore, I would say that God has many times before put things in place, even though they're not used in the same way, are then used later for that which it was not the original intention. They're used in a different state. And then when you get further away from the original state, you begin to forget, how can we go back to that usage when all I know is how it's used in this current state? Because you're thinking from a sinful mindset. It's hard to go back to unring the bell. We can't unring that bell. I'll never know what it's like, neither will you, in this life, to know of a world of just good with no evil. 
I'll never know of what it's like to have no knowledge of good and evil. I'll, I'll never know what that's like, and neither will you in this life. I will not know. It's impossible. I can't unring that bell. So if you can unring that bell of, of, of divoid, divo devoiding yourself of the knowledge of evil and the contrast between good and evil, then Merry Christmas to you, Happy Hanukkah, because I don't know how you're doing that because it's impossible. <laughs> so if you can do that, then you can pull off the answer to the question, how do things change and how God uses them, because that's, you'd have to get rid of your, that bell that's been rung, the sin inside you, and if you can get rid of that, then you can see clearly the issue, but I can't do that, and neither can you, and so we're like, Bleh. we're tied to this loop of constant you know, ignorance until God brings us out of this. Yes? <laughs> I don't like it either too much. <laughs> Greg Sandy said, I love broccoli. Yeah, I love broccoli too, man. I grew into liking asparagus too later on in life where, where Babe doesn't like it too much. Yeah. That's to be done right, though, on both, ca both cases, you know. All right, so uh, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. 1 Timothy 6, um, 15 and 16. Which, okay, wait a minute. Uh, I'll pick up in the middle of a sentence here, but let's go to verse 13. I charge thee in the presence of that God who makes alive all things, 1 Timothy 6, verse 13, makes alive all things, and that Christ Jesus, Yeshua, who testified to Pontius Pilate the good confession, that thou keep the commandment, being spotless and blameless, till the appearance of our Lord Jesus, which is again to maintain until the wave one. He's talking to faithful ones, because the issue is to be aspilos and anapoliptos, before the Epiphania, which is uh, a reference you would give only to faithful ones. So that's the audience here. In verse 15, he says, which in his own season, that blessed and only potentate will exhibit the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here it comes, verse 16. The only one possessing immortality and having light inaccessible, whom no one of men has seen, nor is able to see. To him be honor and might, Aeonian. Amen. Notice how he says, honor and might, Aeonian. <laughs> because what he's saying is, he wants to have Christ fulfill his role as king and judge and rule over the earth for the thousand years. And then, he will then also be on that place of when his glory is manifest in the apocalypse of day eight. Because remember, the revealing of his glory is not until day eight. He's in his kingship office, overseeing Israel and, and helping them to encourage them to bear forth the fruit of at least the minimum 30 fruit yield of the sperma of the secret of the kingdom of the heaven. And that's just the first portion, and then the second portion also is sown to them to have that 30 fruit yield. So, and they most they can get is 60, but they won't be able to get up to the bridal aspect of 100, but they will get to the highest that they can get, which is short of the, the bridal aspect of it. But him doing the kingship and the judgment of those things and the messianic reign for a thousand years, he then will then have that manifestation of the the great white throne, the glory of God being manifested in Christ as we see that as God the Father and God the Son. Of course, we know that later on there's this handing over the kingdom to God the Father. He may be all in all. But there's this prelude of the millennial kingdom of Christ that leads up to the revealing of His glory. Because remember, God the Father and God the Son are one and the same God. But the glory of God ultimately is then shown on the throne of the judgment seat of, of, excuse me, of the great white throne, and also the glory revealed when he becomes seen for who he's ultimately looking to be, which is the bridegroom, to inherit those that be constituted as his bride. Not everybody in Christ, but those who have been inspected by the Father and have that ability to then partake of that diphenon with him in consummation. So that's, that's the true glory of the Father and the Son being shown in their, in their, in their dual roles in that reality. So this is what Paul is inspired to write by the Holy Spirit to talk about the, the might Aeonian, talking about that, 
that last thousand years because that's a beginning of the end that leads to that ultimate glorious stage of all glory because that's when those of us who ever, who ever get to inherit a glorified body get to have that at the end of day seven. We get to have that. So it's wonderful and beautiful to see. Yes? God said, who is verse 16 speaking of? Okay. The one possessing immortality, that's, that's Christ. In his glory. Well, I put it through this way. It's a good point you're making. So, it's because you could say, well, I'm going to say, not going to be Yeshua Christ when they saw him physically, right? Because even John writes about how we saw him to the Gnostics. He writes in First John 1, we saw and touched him. He is a real being because they thought God can't manifest flesh because all flesh is evil. So First John is debunking that by saying we have our own hands, we've touched, we saw with our own eyes, that kind of thing. So here, the verse 16, so how do we, I don't want so yeah, so you're talking. So it's not Christ and the way that I should. I mean, I, I got to rephrase what I just said. So I say Christ because I'm talking about his deity aspect. So the best way to say it, to Brother Todd's point, I shouldn't say God the Son. That's not accurate. What I should say is God. So verse 16 is talking about God and and his deity and his glory, without being veiled by flesh, which means he's not emphasizing God the Son specifically. He's emphasizing the the, the inherent God, godly deit, deity holiness of the, the triune God, the holy, holy, holy God that, that he is. So that's, that's what he's emphasizing is the, the holiness, the glory, the, the inherent deity of the Godhead, which is not specific to God the Son's flesh because that we did, we did see him in flesh. We just talked about that in John 1, 18. John 1, 18, he came and manifested himself in flesh. So... He's not speaking of that to your point. I shouldn't have said Christ. I'm, I said Christ in reference to he's a representation of the Godhead bodily. He says that in Colossians 2.9. So I'm not totally wrong, but to be technically correct, verse 16 is talking to the, the Godhead in a general sense, not in a specific sense. So it's about the glory of God. So it's not the Father or the Son, because he mentions this God the Son in verse 14, of course. Then also, again, he moves on to talk about in reference to that, that manifestation of the glory of God veiled in him in flesh, he's talking about the verse 16, the, the, the holiness and deity behind that in God himself, so that no one has ever seen and no one ever will ever see. But he's talking about the Aeonian uh, reference to that, be, be honor and might Aeonian, going back to why I said Christ, because he's talking about that glory being manifested again and still veiled in that person of the Messiah, Mashiach, reigning over the throne of Father David during that thousand-year millennial reign. So it's not, I'm not off when I said Christ, but I'm not as accurate. I should have said the reference is to God's glory, but how God's glory is manifested in the Messiah during the Messianic reign, because it does mention the Aeonian, which is a reference to his lineal reign. But the focus prior to that is on the glory of God and his deity. Yes? And so that they haven't seen him in his glory, I have an old book saying right. this refers to his kingdom. Yeah, no, you're you're right about that. But here's but the thing is though, like like Todd was saying, it, it's he says that no one has no man has seen nor is able to see. Now when you say kingdom, that's that's in essence this when you say kingdom, I think you're referring to the kingdom of the heavens. So in the heavens he's going to be, you know, obviously he's still gonna be in this in this flesh veil for a thousand years in the millennial reign. Because his his flesh is not is not gonna remove that veil of his glory until the day eight period she begins. Said, she said king of kings. Yeah. So when he's king of kings and lord of lords, so you're talking about in verse uh, 15, so he is king of kings and lord of lords in, in day seven. But he's not revealing his glory just yet because you go from his epiphania, which is the, the rays of the waves of the rapture, tribulation, Armageddon, to now his perusia, which is his presence. So his presence on the earth in his millennial reign, his perusia, his presence, is the king of kings and lord of lords. They, everybody will know him, because remember, he'll have other regents and co-arts, co-arts throughout, co-regents throughout the world he's put in charge to manifest and keep charge. So there'll be other 
in people's minds, I guess you could say, not kings, but rulers that are imputed by Christ to oversee, and there'll be other, what they would call lords or masters on his behalf as ambassadors, but he's the lord of those lords. He's the king of those kings. So it's a reference to his messianic reign. We'll have many minions working and doing his bidding over the whole planet Earth, but he is the king of kings and lord of lords. So it's referencing his messianic reign, whereas his glory, though, is not revealed until he has fulfilled his kingship office, his king judge office. He sets foot off the throne of Father David, and then he goes and ascends into the heavenlies, of course, as the bridegroom. And that's when he, the, the, the glory comes back. And, of course, on the great white throne itself, there's the glory seen by God. And you have that, that glory being manifested for day eight going forward, also in pictured by the holy city coming down and setting foot on the earth. God's glory now dwelling amongst his people, not just veiled by flesh, but totally, you know, whew. and that's why they had the thick darkness on the outside for those who are in glorified bodies or in privileged bodies to partake of that. So they won't die. They're able to partake. Those who are on the outside looking in, that's why they're on the outside thick darkness because they can't, they can only get glimpses or else they would die. And they're being benefited just to be alive. Yes. Pastor Eddie. So sorry about that. I know it's a long, but you're you're right. You guys are on the right thing. It's good. It's a good point you're you're making. It's it's really. So then you go. So in First Timothy six fifteen. So I'll put here. So the glory of. I'll put the Godhead. Triune God, not able to be seen. Only, again, veiled in flesh of God the Son. All right? So then you go to 1 John 4.12. 1 John 4.12. 1 John 4.12, he says, No one has seen God any time. Yet, if we love each other, God dwells in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So he says, No one has seen God at any time. No one. So I'm looking, should I find... So again, we talk about seeing God refers to face of his glory. Or be held unveiled glory of God. No one has. No one has seen God's face in his glory or seen his unveiled glory in, in any other fashion. Even when Moses got a glimpse of his glory or the Peter, James, and John Mass Transfiguration, there was some sort of a veil still in play. There was never an unveiled glory of God unto men. That's that, never the case. So of the, these verses, these are the ones that talk about not seeing God face to face or a man can't see God and dying. I wanted to address those because if we're talking about dreams and vision and God appearing as a man, we've got to address the elephant in the room. For those who might say, whoa, 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 whoa. Man can't see God. He would drop dead. So those dreams and visions and no, 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 that wasn't God. Well, no, it, that's evidence that it is God, actually, because God can appear to man as long as there's a veil. So the verses and the statement or the comment or the, or the principle of mind that God cannot appear to a man is true in that he cannot unveiled just show up in his full glory and say, how you doing? Um, I'm not, because now I'm dead. He cannot just show up in his glory and be like, how you doing? Just want to hang out, talk to you a little bit? Um, you, you can't do that because now I'm dead. So he has to come always in some veil, in a dream, in a vision, as a man, in a fire, in a cloud, a thick, a thick, a thick darkness. I don't know. I don't know. So God's not stupid. God's smart. He's brilliant, right? So he comes to us 
always with a visage or a veil or some kind of barrier between he and us because we can't, we can't handle the truth, if you will. I mean, we would die. So what's talking, what he's talking about is we cannot see God on an even playing field, in other words. <coughs> we can't do it. You can't do it. It's just like some people, for example, you, you know there's some people that, that you would, uh, <laughs> it's, it's almost like when you're, anybody here has kids or grandkids, and so there's always that time in life, whether they're a girl or a boy, they have that time, they want to, they want a little, they want to, you know, a little wrestle with you a little bit, a little play time, a little, little push around. They want to test mom and dad. Sometimes they test mom thinking she's weaker. Sometimes they'll test dad to see his patience. Either way, they lose both times, right? Because there's a certain place in time where you're going to put your foot down at, at their younger ages and let them know you, you don't want the real strength of who I am to come out, little one. You do know this is a joke, right? You do realize that I can squash you like a grape, right? But you don't do that because <laughs> you are veiling or you're restraining yourself, right? When you're in that fun wrestling mode or when you're in that situation where they're trying to really, you know, push you over the edge and to see a reaction, you restrain yourself. Well, a God who's a sinless, holy, perfect, unblemished God who's infinitely greater than any of our minds can, can, together can even fathom is all the more reason how he talks to us as his kids going to restrain himself and veil himself for our sake. He knows we're, he, we can't handle that. We can't handle hearing from him you know, with, no, with no inhibitions. We, would just, we can't handle that. Woo! That'd just blow us away, man. So that's what he's talking about, and that's what he's, he's referring to in this aspect. So lastly, before we end on this issue, before we go on Sunday's uh, study of the angel of the Lord comment, I'm going to end with a little crescendo of how angels did appear as men in Genesis 6. We'll look at that there. So go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, he says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, and they were, they were fair, and they, look, and they took them wives, all of which they chose. And this word took means to take by force, which means they raped them. Hence, you had giants in the land. Then you Genesis 19. Genesis 19, very simply put. And he says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, Turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you should rise up and go on your ways. And they said, No. But we abide in the street all night. And if you look into the rest of the, vo rest of the, the next two verses, And he pressed, urged them greatly. They turned in unto him, and he entered into the house. And he made them a feast, and baked unleavened bread, and they ate it. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed around the house, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter, it says, they called to Lot and said to them, Where are the men which came into you to this night? So pretty clear that those are men in Genesis. I should change that to verse 5, not verse 2. So you get that context of seeing that angels came to, to Lot as men. Then you go to Daniel in chapter 10. Daniel in chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 5 through 21. Daniel chapter 10. He says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of, of Euphaz. His body was like that, like the burl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in the color of polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multi multitude. In verse 7 of Daniel 10, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. But nevertheless, a great quaking fell upon them, and so they, they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this great vision. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. And I retained, Did I put Daniel on the board for vision, by the way? I should have. I missed him. 
I put them on, I forgot them, my mistake. I just realized I didn't put them on the board. I'm wiping this off, hold on a second. I don't want to make that mistake. I don't want to forget my boy Daniel. I had him on last week's board, but I forgot him when I was doing the review. Oh, forgive me, Lord. Okay. Daniel's an no, important character. All right. So, so then we look and he says, and I restrained in verse 9. I restrained, I retained no, no strength. Yet in verse 9, I heard the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face. And my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which sat me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you. And in standing upright, for unto you I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from this first day that shall give thine heart to understand and to humble yourself before the face of thy God, Elohim. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia, and now I come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I, gave my, I set my face toward the ground, and I became mute and dumb. And behold, one like a similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake, and I said unto him that stood before me, O my Adonai, by the vision my sorrows had turned upon me, and I retained no strength. For whom, how can thy servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as, as for me, straight away there remained no strength in me. Neither is there any breath left in me. Then there came again, and, and he touched me, one like the appearance of a man. And he strengthened me, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee, be strong, and, be, and yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord Adonai, for thou hast strengthened me. Then he said, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto you? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, behold, the prince of Greece shall come, but I will show you that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holds me, holds with me in these things, but Michael, your prince, your governor. Now, in that whole co compilation of what we just read, you saw Daniel interacting with both, one is the son of man, Yahshua, but also an angel himself working with Michael the archangel, as we saw. So we see a man manifested, angel manifested as a man, but you also see a little difference of interaction there of, of, my, of Daniel seeing this other visage. So you definitely see Daniel interacting with an angel manifested as a man. We see that. Okay? Now you see in Luke 24 4. Here you get Luke 24 4. We all know this from the resurrection, but bears mind to just remind you. Angels did appear as men. Luke 24, 4. And it occurred as they were in perplexity about this. Behold, two men stood by them in shining clothing. Now, this is not regular men. We know this is angels appearing as men. So it's rather interesting in Luke 24, 4. Then we see in Hebrews 13, 2. Hebrews 13, 2. In Hebrews 13, 2, he says, Be not neglectful of hospitality, for though, for through this some unconsciously, that means unawares, unknowingly, entertained angels. <laughs> Which means they appear as humans, right? Let's get real. And then Jude 6 and 7, for those who still doubt angels can be appearing as men. He says, And those angels, in verse 6 of Jude, who kept not their first principality, their first estate, they left their own habitation. He kept in perpetual chains in the thick darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, which in like manner to these committed fornication and went after strange flesh, that means heterox, different from flesh, are placed as an example, enduring the retributive justice of Aeonian fire, proving again that these are the angels, again, that we're talking about in Genesis chapter 6. Those are the ones referenced there in Jude that left their first estate and went after different flesh. Their flesh was without blood, 
they went after flesh that had blood. Their flesh was animated by spirit. The human flesh animated by blood. Their flesh was sinful human. The angelic was a flesh of sinlessness. That is inappropriate. That is not a like communion, obviously. Hence, giants ensued. So you have these issues here mentioned. Now also, lastly, as, uh, as you can say for a bonus round, I will take you through some scriptures to show you how the angels also speak to looking at in book the book of Matthew. We'll go back and see how angels are to remind you. They are uh, in reference to uh, guardians of different aspects. So look into Matthew 18 and verse 10. Just three passages, then we're done for tonight. In Matthew 18 and verses 1 through 10, the context in verse 1 of Matthew 18 is the kingdom of the heavens. We go on in verse 3, kingdom of the heavens. We go on in verse 4, kingdom of the heavens. We go on and talk about how you shouldn't uh, ensnare a pation or a mikros. Then he goes on into chapter uh, 10, chapter, excuse me, chapter 18, verse 10. And he says, take care that you do not despise one of the least of these, for I assure you that, that their angels in the heavens continually behold the face of that Father of mine in the heavens. So it's pretty clear in the context that the little ones he's talking about aren't just any little ones, but little ones of the heavens. So therefore, the Mikros and the Pation of the heavens have a guardian angel. So those in the sperma have a guardian angel. That's clear from Matthew chapter 18 verse 10, but the context is speaking clearly about kingdom of the heavens if you just read it from verse 1 to 10. Pretty clear. Then you can go to the book of Acts, chapter 12. Book of Acts, chapter 12. We saw this in our study of Acts, but it bears always mind to go back and remind you. In verse 14 and 15, And having recognized Peter's voice, she opened not the gate from joy. But running in, told them that Peter was standing at the gate. This is Rhoda. In verse 15 of Acts 12, they said to her, You are mad! As in, she's a raven lunatic, right? But she strongly asserted, she vehemently said, You don't understand. Paraphrase. See, it was so. And they said, It is his angel. Say what? It's the angel of Peter, is how it's read, read in the Koine Greek, as in it's his personal angel. Excuse me? Excuse me? What, what, what was that? So therefore, we have angelic host in Matthew 18, assigned to Mikros and Pation, who are in the sperma, the secret of the kingdom of the God exposure. We have in Acts chapter 12, an evidence of a faithful one having his own specific angel. Matthew is more of a generalistic of angels over them, whereas here is a specific individual angel with Peter, his angel. Pretty, pretty crazy. And lastly, last verse in Hebrews chapter 1. We all know this one before. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Now it's more inclusive also. In Hebrews 1, verse 14. And he says... Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth for service on account of those being about to inherit salvation? So we have three references to angels ministering to us. Two are specific, without a doubt, literally to those who have the secret of the kingdoms of the heaven. One, in a general sense, anybody who's in Mikros and up, in Sperma. And Matthew 18 and Acts 12, specific individually to the faithful one. And then we have here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, to anybody who is a going to be an heir, which means those of Sporos also are included. So anybody who is trusting and obeying and bearing fruit of the Spirit of Christ is going to have an angel ministering with them on an active basis. So I contend that, yes, there are angels in a general sense watching over everybody, but they're not as directly involved unless you're one of those three people. You're either a person who's of the kingdom, uh, micro stage and up, sanctified in the kingdom, understanding of the secret of the kingdom, you're the faithful one, 
or you're a person who's an heir in general, trusting, obeying, and bearing the fruit of Christ and the sporos or sperma, and therefore you have angels ministering to you directly. Other than that, you're, you're indirectly helped and aided by different angels around you and so forth and so on. But that means you do not have your own specific guardian angel. That's a tradition of mankind that's not actually biblical. What's biblical is that faithful ones do have a guardian angel. That's a fact. Because it said that if Peter had his own, that means it was known that that was a fact. They wouldn't say that wasn't a fact. And then secondly, we know that angels are directly being given to minister to the Mikros and up in the kingdom of the secrets being given to them. And then we also know those who are of any kind of heirship looking to trust and obey and bear, fruit, bear forth fruit the Spirit of Christ. Those people of Sporos or of Sperma are also directly ministered to by, by, the, by the angelic hosts. So that's what we know about them. So I bring that up only because of a, of a side rabbit trail a little bit to the angelic side of it. But I want to get back to, because we're, we're going to get into that phrasing, the angel of the Lord. That's coming up for Sunday. All right? So I'll put that on the board just so we would know. So that's, there's the angel of the Lord. All right? Because that's what we're going to talk about on Sunday. And I'll put on the side note here. So angels minister to Mikros and up and sperma. And I'll put Matthew 18, 1 to 10. And then they also I'll put out here they the faithful ones in sperma. And I'll put Acts 12, what is that? 14 and 15? Yeah. 14 and 15. And then I'll put lastly um, all heirs. Asporos and sperma. And that's Hebrews 1.14. So with that being said, we're going to go into the angel of the Lord on Sunday. And I think we've addressed, in essence, the issues of being, did I put, yeah, I got the carry, I got the angels appearing as men, aligned with this piece of God appearing as a man, being carried away in spirit, angels ministering unto people differently. But Again, we're covering all these different things that may be splinters in your mind that attach themselves to that other thought, but I want to sum that up into getting ready now. We're primed up now to get into the real issue of where there's the most amount of scriptures to kind of dig out through is this angel of the Lord issue. We're going to dig into this and see it from the, there's a lot of references to that, and we're going to see that throughout the Old Testament, okay? So is there any uh, questions or comments before we close out for tonight? I actually got through the material I thought I was going to get through. It's amazing. That rarely happens. <laughs> Are we good? Are there another type of... So tell you what, we'll just... We'll have a time of... We'll, we'll pray, and if there's any gleanings afterwards, we'll just continue to, to talk. You okay, babe? Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for this time, opportunity. Again, we've had to gather with you uh, to be your children, your servants, learning and understanding from your feet and from your word your spirit to enlighten and encourage and let us see and know the truth. I thank you for your reminders of your presence. We know that you've done this before with dreams and visions and appearance as a man and even through different facets of nature. So Father, we thank you for the manifestation as literally coming and walking amongst us as the Messiah. As now we have looked back and see that time, we always look back and remember that in this current state, we have a living word in front of us that testifies of your life that you've lived, that you validated everything that we hold in our hands we call the scripture, the Bible, the word of God. So we ask you to continue to help us to be understanding, enlightened by your truth, loving to you and loving to each other. Be with us throughout this weekend. Bring us back together safe, Father. We thank you in all you do and have done and continue to do. In Jesus' Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.